Chapter 23. Recapitalization. A man who beyond the age of 26 finds himself on a bus can count himself a failure. Misattributed to Margaret Thatcher. 23.1. Federalization. In the United States, the appropriate federal role in transit, even in interstate passenger service, remains a long-standing question. As noted in Chapter 14, transit was beginning its long post-World War II decline from 1946. Ridership was down and costs were up. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, private commuter railroads faced the beginning of what seems to be a perpetual funding crisis. While the population was more urban and suburban than rural, there was still resistance to urban programs. Even the Brookings Institution argued against federal support for commuter trains. President-elect Kennedy supported a $100 million mass transportation loan program proposed by New Jersey Senator Harrison Williams. This eventually passed as a $50 million loan and $25 million demonstration grants, not for long-term capital improvements, as well as a small planning program. But while loans might be more palatable to Congress, budget officials pointed out that they would offer little incentive to communities which had reached their debt limit or which could float municipal tax-exempt bonds at a lower interest rate than federal loans. They also emphasized that the only criteria in the Williams Bill for setting the magnitude of federal financial participation had been how much Congress might be persuaded to accept. Loans were nevertheless endorsed by the Urban Coalition of Metropolitan Areas and the private railroads. Authorization was subsequently cut from $75 million to $42.5 million by the House, which was less sensitive to urban issues at the time than the Senate. Mass transit was then housed in the Housing and Home Finance Agency, later the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. This positioning of transit and housing together is echoed by the Obama administration's livability initiatives, cutting across the United States Department of Transportation and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. The concern of locating mass transit within the Department of Commerce was the influence of the Bureau of Public Roads. In 1964, a $375 million urban transportation program was passed and signed by President Johnson. However, this program took the form of grants rather than loans, which were, by their very nature, more favored by states and metropolitan areas. In the post-interstate era, there has been less new construction, highway expansion has slowed, more federal funds go to transit, about 25% of federal surface transportation capital funds go to transit, and the match requirement for states has increased. The spread of slums in the inner cities of metropolitan areas, the relative decline of central business districts, and the relative or absolute loss of central city population together with the many social problems of the older, low-income parts of central cities focused national attention on urban problems. The federal government was asked to come to the rescue of the cities. It did so with a variety of crime prevention, health, welfare, physical redevelopment, and other programs. Included was Action to Aid Transit, the creation of the Urban Mass Transit Administration, UMTA, in 1964. The creation of the Urban Mass Transit Administration, now the Federal Transit Administration, and the working out of its relations involved a diverse group of outside government interested parties. Large rail operators in old cities, commuter bus and rail, the downtown business interest groups, and auto opponents all had their own interests. At the time, there was no single voice for the operators, and they were split between rail and bus. The National Conference of Mayors served the urban development downtown business interests. A crisis was sensed, but the crisis had many interpretations. Finally, there was no clear model and set of existing suitable institutions. The closest model was the Department of Housing and Urban Development's HUD programs. HUD knew how to work with the cities. It had subsidy programs. It was chosen as the first home for UMTA, with a study of the advantages of remaining in HUD versus moving to the new United States Department of Transportation to be made. The first home seemed to satisfy the urban development interests that had worked with HUD, However, at the end of the first year, UMTA moved. Absent a close model, there was the problem of figuring out a government role satisfactory to diverse parties. Charles Haar, a member of the Harvard Law School faculty and the first UMTA administrator, worked hard to establish an urban development role. Even so, the mood that held was the, that better management technology was needed, and that helped pull UMTA into the DOT sphere. At the time, DOT was striving to play a major role in research and technology development, fallout from the if we can put a man on the moon, why can't we? Thinking. UMTA learned to work with the states and the cities and the American Public Transit Association, APTA, has emerged as a force in the industry and has learned how to work with other groups, such as the American Bus Association. A national need for UMTA was arguable, but it was seldom challenged. Changed programs in HUD seem to have provided models for change in UMTA. 
For instance, change such as that driven by emulation of the private sector in program activities seems to be the HUD model. The Americans disabled for accessible public transportation fought for wheelchair lifts on all buses. See also section 23.7 for some consideration of the problem. UMTA accepted that in section 405 of its regulations, APTA was forced into the role of protecting capital short operators who cannot afford lifts. APTA's interesting defense was that this is a local matter, that properties ought to figure out the mix of bus and special van services. That's interesting because it departs from the all issues or national stance of APTA. A good bit of what UMTA was able to establish in its organic legislation, bureaucrats worked out the rest. Steps taken early on had lasting impact. Most of those steps were mandated by one or more interest groups that supported the creation of UMTA. We now list some decisions taken early on. Students of urban affairs and government administrators had the notion that transit management was up through the ranks, and unskilled, trained managers with business school backgrounds were needed. As a result, UMTA and local agencies didn't take advantage of experienced employees who knew what did and didn't work. Political hacks were also rampant in the industry. The perceived need to turn over management resulted in lots of know-nothing managers, especially at UMTA. The renewal of capital was urgent. Some thought that a one-shot renewal might be enough. Others had the notion that technological improvements were needed. Interest groups composed of traditional suppliers, aerospace and engineering and contracting firms pressed this new view, garnering public support. The Disneyland monorail was new, and that was the model in many minds. The capital grants program resulted. Another result was a round of new system studies and encouragement of defense contractors. This emphasis, together with the hoops one had to jump through in government procurement, put the traditional suppliers out of business, suppliers such as St. Louis Carr and Pullman. Later, the aerospace industry found it couldn't make money. Lacking technology management capability, UMTA engaged in some disasters. Its bus development program was an example. 3. People who wanted to manage the urban problem in a holistic way and those who wanted independent programs for UMTA were engaged in a behind-the-scenes tug-of-war. Do we combine transit with health, housing, education, and other urban social programs? UMTA kept a distance from those programs, and the void created was filled mainly by the then Department of Health, Health Education, and Welfare. School bus programs operated by local governments continued, of course. This debate continues today, pressed by those who want to coordinate public agency decision-making about land use and transportation services. Next was the question of geographic organization of UMTA programs. Political reality said that these could not just be big city programs. When UMTA was created, there were many central city transit agencies, both public and private service providers in the suburbs, and also a mixture of service providers in small towns and rural areas. How could UMTA interrelate with so many entities? How would it work with state and metropolitan area organizations? How would transit facility investments fit into transportation planning activities? By and large, UMTA was careful to fit in with existing arrangements, support both large city and other constituents, and go along with a large amount of congressional earmarking of expenditures and pressure for the expenditure of so-called discretionary grant funds. UMTA did adopt the public administration dogma that single public agency organizations were best for urban areas, avoid duplication, obtain economy of scale, but that's very questionable. 5. Another question to be settled was that of the size of UMTA and whether it should be restricted to equipment facility programs. Giving way to political pressure, subsidies have been made available for operations. The size issue remains a debate, although transit has access to highway trust funds, partially relieving the funding constraint on program size. Twenty three point two San Francisco's BART. The Bay Area Rapid Transit District, BART, Subway Elevated Commuter Train System, began providing service on September 11, 1972, and it is a Bay Area icon. Although there is no place to take such a picture, one imagines sleek trains with the Golden Gate Bridge and palm trees in the background. Sponsored by central city politicians, property owners, and newspapers, it was the first new transit system in the United States after World War II. BART, and to a lesser extent the Washington Metro and Atlanta MARTA systems, served as a model for the wave of rail transit improvement projects promoted in subsequent decades, and that is why we emphasize it. Also, it illustrates that the gap between hype and reality can be great, but invisible to publics and policymakers. Centered on Oakland, BART service fans out westward under the bay through San Francisco to its airport, north and south along the East Bay, and to suburbs to the northeast and southeast of Oakland. It is rather a skeletal mainline system, 
more so as extensions have been added over the years. It is essentially a commuter railroad serving San Francisco, Oakland, and other of the older centers in, of employment in the region. In a metropolitan area of about 7.4 million people, it serves about 342,000 one-way riders per day. Since riders are one-way and most people make round trips, the number of people served is about half that number. Thus, in a region with about 22 million total trips, about 1.5% of weekday trips are by BART. BART serves about a quarter of the 1.2 million transit trips in the Bay Area. Initial investment capital was backed by imposts on property in three Bay Area counties, and funds for the completion of the system and extensions have come mainly from the federal government. In 2010, net operating expenses are about $647 million per year. About 57% of this is recovered by fares, which is very good by U.S. standards. Capital costs are not recovered. In today's contentious world, anyone questioning transit costs is taken to be ignorant and pro-automobile. Even so, let's do a bit of math on costs anyway. It will give a feel for magnitudes. The BART extension to Pittsburgh Bay Point to the northeast of Oakland cost $505 million, and it serves about 3,000 round-trip daily riders. Certainly, many of these patrons are regular commuters to centers of employment. Dividing capital cost by the number of riders says that about $170,000 has been invested per rider. Considering interest in order to calculate annual cost, there is a capital subsidy of about $17,000 per rider per year. It is left as an exercise for the reader to compute the daily subsidy and per one-way trip per rider. What's more, there is an operating subsidy applying to each rider, so the total subsidy is somewhat higher. Numbers in this range apply to many transit investments, especially rail investments. The $505 million divided by 6.8 million people in the Bay Area works out to about $74 per person in the Bay Area. But that is ignored because much of that money went to Washington and came back as free money. An irony is that the Yamamoto 2003 article highlighted BART board director Roy Nakadagawa, who was a transit supporter but questioned the wisdom of BART expansion. If no one pays attention to him, what's the use of our math? The best known early work on comparative costs was done by Ted Keeler in the early 1970s. This figure from that publication compares automobiles, bus, and BART. It needs to be remarked that the service niche is favorable to the bus. It's the comparison that is important. Rail is expensive compared to bus. There is never a critical word of the iconic BART in the newspapers. Citizens assume that the service is essential, and although they are more than elusive to analysts, BART is assumed to have had great positive impacts on community and regional development. Ignoring the probability that, if desired, private sector investors and consumers long ago would have energized developments at BART stations, concentrated development near BART stations is high on Bay Area planners' wish lists. Moreover, there is clamor for extensions to swing BART through San Jose and complete connections around the South Bay. 23.3, Washington's Metro. The Great Society Subway, as Schreg calls Washington, D.C.'s Metro Rail, is the East Coast sister to BART. The technologies are similar, though not identical, and one wonders why the opportunity to achieve economies of scale in car purchases, procurement, and design was not sought. And they opened a few years apart. Metro is the more successful sibling, with 762,653 weekday riders as of March 2012. Washington had long been served by commuter rail service and streetcars, from 1862 as horse cars, through 1962. Subway plans for Washington first emerged in 1959, when lines were proposed for downtown. A 1962 plan proposed an 89-mile, 143-kilometer rail network. The 1968 adopted regional system metro rail plan, 97 miles extended to 103 miles in 1984, was constructed essentially unchanged, completed by 2001. In one sense, a plan is a contract, so abiding by the plan gives certainty to those who rely on it, for example, prospective landowners and developers or other transportation planning agencies. In another sense, this lock-in reduces the flexibility of Metro to adapt to changes. The planned highway network of 1968 did not materialize, nor did the land use pattern. So why is one rail network optimized for one set of conditions also optimal for another? Unlike the San Francisco Bay region, which is tightly bound by geography, water and mountains, channelizing development and laying obvious where lines would go, Washington is much less constricted. Since the original system was fully built, one major new line has been started, the Silver Line to Dulles Airport, see section 22.4.4, there have been some extensions in infill stations, and some additional services have been added. 
Like BART, Metrorail is costly and it is debatable whether it is worth the cost. Increased development in the city of Washington would be difficult without Metrorail or other public transit services. The District of Columbia employment ranges from 687,000 in 1990 to 660,000 in 2002 to 733,000 in 2012, an increase that would have been very difficult in the absence of public transit. In 1990, the Washington region led the United States in carpooling with 16%, due in large part to its system of HOV lanes, while its regional transit mode share was 13%. In the absence of Metrorail, one could imagine buses, probably in dedicated lanes, providing the additional service, but not private vehicles. To serve that growth in the central city, transit is necessary. In the absence of transit, that growth would not have occurred in the central city. But that job growth undoubtedly would have occurred somewhere. The land use pattern and transportation technology to serve it are joint processes. Twenty three point four Other People's Money Rational Behavior in Irrational America. Working out the matters just discussed partly describes the situation today. Most of those matters are not completely resolved, of course. Conservative members of the national government question the federal role in transit, but we do not see that as much of a threat to the program partly because conservative downtown property owners are supportive of transit. As is well known today, there are subsidies covering fixed and much of the operating cost of transit. They run about $70 per capita per year and are increasing. Although many who do not have automobiles available and or lack the means to purchase and use private transportation are transit users, overall there is an income transfer to the wealthy, especially commuters. Ridership has declined to the point where about 2% of all trips are by bus and streetcar and about 0.3% by other rail. In 2007, passenger miles break down as shown in the figure. Buses, including school buses, intercity buses, and transit buses, and rail transit comprise fewer than 3.5% of all trip distance. Buses are the vast majority. 35% of all U.S. transit trips are in New York City, and over one-half in New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and Chicago. Cities are planning new systems or expansions of old ones, and vast funds will be required for these. It seems clear that we need to preserve and improve services in urban environments such as those found in San Francisco and other old, densely populated cities. Citizens who do not have access to private automobiles need service. But nowhere is it carved in granite that the federal government is necessary to achieve these goals, and that its program should be continued. One might say that the federal transit programs are a success because transit service has been preserved. But might there have been other, better ways to do that? Might downsizing the market specialization, as illustrated by the U.S. freight railroad industry, serve better? How do we get into this situation? We are there because of a lack of cognition. A major part of the problem is other people's money. In the U.S. funding environment of the past four decades, transit capital expenditures are in large part paid for from Washington, but operating costs are local. Rational local governments acting in an irrational system have every incentive to make projects capital intensive and minimize operating costs. One meets with policymakers and discusses modal costs and services. It is stressed that fixed rail, people movers, and monorail are off the chart expensive when cost effectiveness is considered. Alternatives such as improved bus services or even buying used vehicles or paying for taxis for those who can't drive now are seldom considered. Real improvements, those that make a factor or two or better changes, should be tried. But policymakers pay no attention to such suggestions. They have already decided that autos and buses are non feasible solutions to problems. Rail is the only answer. Exactly what the problem is isn't always clear. In cases the authors are familiar with, Denver, Minneapolis, Chicago, CBD access was the main issue, but this is a problem that has not worsened in several decades as CBD employment is flat, while in contrast other transportation problems have worsened. In other cases, congestion generally and air pollution have been at issue. There also seems to be the feeling that modern cities have streetcars. What else is there to discuss, especially since the feds will pay much of the bill? Expressions like, Minneapolis-St. Paul is the largest city in North America without rail transit were bandied about, illustrating the competitiveness question. To be a world-class city, one must have a new rail system, a new Major League Baseball stadium, a new professional football stadium, a new college football stadium, a new basketball arena, a new hockey arena, a new minor league baseball stadium, a beltway with three lanes. Minneapolis-St. Paul was at one time apparently also the largest city in North America with a two-lane beltway. A convention center, a festival marketplace, and so on. And in Minneapolis-St. Paul, if Minneapolis has it, then St. Paul needs it as well. Transit is just one more instance of featureitis. We judge that policymakers, newspapers, and others see transit as the only solution and rail transit as the superior choice. We think that is because they can't imagine seeking new solutions. 23.5. Docklands Light Railway and the Jubilee. 
The experience outside the United States differs greatly. The privately operated under franchise agreement Docklands Light Railway, DLR, opened in 1987 after three years of construction and just a few years after conception. In 1982, according to TFL, though antecedents can be seen as early as the 1973 Dockland study, according to the London Dockland Development Corporation, to serve the emerging Docklands Regeneration Project centered at Canary Wharf. The existing system and the proposed extensions are shown in the figure. All of the built extensions since 1987 were foreseen by Jolly and Bayman, 1986, but not the subsequently proposed ones. Containerization of shipping changed the nature of that industry, which migrated in the 1960s and 1970s from London to Felixstowe. The Docklands development replaced the newly abandoned shipping docks in East London with an emerging financial center, an American-like downtown for London. Almost immediately upon opening, construction started on extensions. Success begat success, and proposals and funding for extensions to this new Docklands-centered automated public transport technology continued to flow in. By 2010, the DLR system was serving 80 million passengers per year, 300,000 per weekday. As can be seen from the map, extensions continue to be proposed, notably to Charing Cross. The early DLR segments took advantage of abandoned railway lines, and while not a greenfield, it was a relatively open brownfield canvas on which to work. The planning for the Jubilee Line, then the Fleet Line, named for Fleet Street and the River Fleet, apparently began around 1965. The first section opened in 1979, two years after the Silver Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth, for whom it was named. The line temporarily terminated at Charing Cross Station. It was to continue eastward along Fleet Street. In 1999, the Jubilee line was extended to Canary Wharf as well, but this eastward extension resulted in the abandonment of the then 20-year-old extension to Charing Cross, as a new routing split from the old and green park. The decision to do this can be seen as early as the 1990 Jubilee Line Extension Options Map. At this point, the expensive Charing Cross Station was just over 10 years old. Stations are often more expensive and require more tunneling volume than the lines which they connect, so this is a major rethink, not some temporary train halt that was subsequently bypassed. Jubilee Line Extension is said to have cost £3.5 billion, which delayed other significant potential construction projects such as Crossrail, currently under construction, and Crossrail 2, running from Chelsea to Hackney. There are several points to be made about this. No one in the 1970s anticipated abandoning the Jubilee Line portion of Charing Cross Station, certainly not so soon after construction. No one in the 1970s or 80s or 90s anticipated that the DLR might one day reoccupy Charing Cross Station, or even construct such a large cross-London network centered on the Docklands. Speculation about this emerged in the first decade of the 2000s. While the underground system is centered on the square mile of the City of London, with many branches in a circle line, DLR has a new hub to the east at Canary Wharf with a new driverless technology that interconnects with the old at several key stations, and if the extensions are built, at several more. In order to build anything, you must have a vision. Rarely does construction start without a fixed end point in mind. This is not SimCity. That construction, once made, is largely irreversible. Though it may be abandoned and it provides opportunities for reuse, it creates facts on the ground that are hard to undo. The City of London Street Network is a perfect example. Even after the Great Fire of 1666 or the bombings of World War II, it it greatly resembles the facts on the ground at the time of William the Conqueror. In order to move forward, you must be willing to abandon old visions. The DLR and Jubilee line extensions were new visions built on top of and beneath old constructions, not old visions. They were even willing to abandon the one major fact on the ground, Charing Cross Station, so as not to be wed to a vision that no longer worked. Facts on the ground create new constraints, new opportunities, new ways of looking at the world. There are many possible lines in a network, but only a few can actually be built. Transportation networks are far from optimal, always will be, but the planner needs to consider what is the best decision given the world as it exists, not the world as it might be according to some plan. We ought not be too locked into our plans. We forgo many opportunities by clinging to the zombie maps of long-dead officials. 23.6 Challenge Serving the Disadvantaged The urban highway system substituted only in part for transit, and many of transit's problems result from a failure of the auto highway system. For instance, there is an inability to provide high-quality personal transportation services to the poor, physically and mentally disabled, the elderly, or children, which is not to say that fixed-route transit provides high-quality services for these groups either. Moreover, this is a growing problem. In the developed world, the populations of the elderly and non-native speakers are increasing rapidly. It is important to emphasize that these groups, while indicative of the disadvantaged, 
are not generally incapacitated and, aside from the under-5 population, contain individuals fully able to use any and every mode of transportation. Transportation service providers serve multiple groups. Each group has a separate problem. The elderly find giving up the flexibility of the automobile very traumatic. Rather than seek assistance or use transit, which may not go to the desired destination anyway and is perceived as dangerous, many will forego trips and activities. The challenge facing the disabled is not the loss of flexibility, it is its absence. The transportation system is designed for the physically able. The disabled are considered an afterthought. The trend toward community-based living compounds the problem, as many communities are poorly served by transit. Many developmentally disabled individuals require supervision when traveling, greatly restricting options and thus flexibility. Transfers become especially burdensome as a single transit driver no longer can be counted on to keep an eye out for the traveler. Poor families, especially those working poor who have multiple jobs but no vehicle, may need to work shifts during which no transit is provided. Daycare services may be available. and provide a safe environment for poor children, but a safe means to get between the service and home is also required. The automobile still requires both driving skill and capital. In previous eras, the transit network was sufficient to serve almost all users. However, the reduction in transit demand and the transformation of the urban landscape have worsened transit service for those who still depend on it. A negative effect of the auto is worse transit. Fixed-route public transit systems cannot provide the kind of point-to-point -point services that the transportation disadvantage require. If we relax a policy constraint, only fixed-route public transit systems can provide transit services, we imagine many more services for specific populations of the transportation disadvantaged. A number of suggestions along those lines have been made in numerous research articles. Yet, the transit monopoly is reluctant, for obvious reasons, to let go. There is a reluctance to allow taxis to be the service provider for the transportation disadvantaged. At best, there are paratransit on-demand dial-a-ride services, while often considered a backwater when compared to the fixed route services used by advantaged or less disadvantaged travelers, itself considered a backwater by others in the transportation field. Providing this service efficiently is one of the greatest technical challenges in transportation, but also promises an alternative technological path that might become mainstream in the future. The field has seen its share of innovations, but not just by vehicle makers. For instance, Everett Rogers and collaborators Rice and Rogers, 1980, and Rogers et al., 1979, best known for the diffusion of innovations, identified 77 innovations in dial-a-ride developed by users rather than manufacturers or system integrators. Notably, most U.S. cities and many outside the U.S. prohibit private jitney services preventing the innovations in dial-a-ride from being deployed to service a wider market and from the scaling up of markets to generate further innovations. Over the longer term, we imagine that autonomous vehicles that can operate both in on and off special facilities might be of use. If the physical and mental abilities of the driver were no longer factors in ensuring a safe trip, travelers or their guardians could simply instruct the vehicle where to go. Twenty three point seven Universal Design Universal Design is the design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible, without the need for adaptation or specialized design. Ron Mace. The problems that transportation disadvantaged individuals face are similar to, but more severe, than the problems that the rest of the population see on a day to day basis. Take, for instance, the simple question of which bus goes from the bus stop nearest my home to downtown. When going to the bus stop, is information provided other than the simple sign saying bus stop? Many stops don't even identify routes, much less schedules. Without a guide, either person or documentation, using the system entails taking great risks, among them the risk of winding up across town from your desired destination and being hours late. The relatively simple but seemingly revolutionary idea of providing information with the service may help. For instance, operators should make the signage clear so that the bus stop can be found, Make clear the route number, route endpoints, and the direction toward which the user needs to travel at the bus stop. Make clear when the bus is coming, especially when service is infrequent. Clearly convey to the user when he or she should get off the bus, which may require more than drivers announcing the bus stops as the bus travels the route. While this may be critical for those who are unfamiliar with the location, tourists, or the language, immigrants, it is also important for those who are cognitively challenged and would probably provide a much better travel experience for those who lack special difficulties. Some transit systems do this, especially in downtown areas. Others would rather spend money on new rail construction, seeking new wealthier customers, than make the existing bus system, serving existing poorer customers, work well. 
To provide another example, when the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed, a major concern was retrofitting buses with elevators to accommodate wheelchairs. Buses traditionally had steps leading from the ground to the level where passengers sit. A more universal design would lower the floor of the bus and gradually raise the level of the ground at the bus stop so that wheelchairs could roll onto the vehicle the way that occurs on many subway systems. Such a system would benefit many others with poor knees who can walk fine steps difficult. The lowering of the floor of buses is becoming more common, the raising of bus stops less so. Having a universal design assists those who need the assistance while benefiting others. The principles of universal design are a set of values, but they are hard to disagree with. 1. Equitable use. The design is useful and marketable to people with diverse abilities. 2. Flexibility in use. The design accommodates a wide range of individual preferences and abilities. 3. Simple and intuitive use. Use of the design is easy to understand regardless of the user's experience, knowledge, language skills, or current concentration level. 4. Perceptible information. The design communicates necessary information effectively to the user, regardless of ambient conditions or the user's sensory abilities. 5. Tolerance for error. The design minimizes hazards and the adverse consequences of accidental or unintended actions. 6. Low physical effort. The design can be used efficiently and comfortably and with a minimum of fatigue. 7. Size and space for approach and use. Appropriate size and space are provided for. Approach, reach, manipulation, and use, regardless of user's body size, posture, and mobility. Twenty three point eight. Personal Rapid Transit Imagination in Search of a Market. Personal Rapid Transit or PRT systems are a hybrid between transit and the private vehicle. In a sense, they can be thought of as horizontal elevators. You enter a small car, push your destination, and the vehicle takes you there. The vehicle carries one to four individuals, typically along an elevated guideway. Unlike traditional elevators, the guideway is such that vehicles can pass each other, so that passengers can reach their destination without stops along the way. The uses for such systems vary, from within airport transportation to urban circulators. Promoters claim that PRT can become an important part of the urban transportation scene. Yet, despite some demonstrations of technical feasibility, they are not considered outside of narrow niches. Sydney has constructed a lightweight urban monorail which serves similar market niches, as do people movers, such as in Detroit and Miami. However, those systems have fixed stops and have not been widely lauded or imitated outside airports and amusement parks. Serious PRT development can be traced in the 1950s when Edward Haltom developed the monocab, which was suspended from an overhead guideway that needed to move for switching. Its disadvantages were its height, resulting in cantilever posts that increased the cost and visual impact of the system. Under the Urban Mass Transit Administration, a different PRT system was deployed at Morgantown, West Virginia in the 1970s. It was very simple with stops at two ends, serving a college market, and though technologically successful, not the kind of large market promoters sought. U.S. federal government funding for research in the area was withdrawn in the 1980s as efforts focused on more conventional rail transit systems. In France, a great deal of effort went into developing a technology called Aramis, a PRT that allowed vehicles to couple and decouple to gain some of the advantages of trains. The system was sufficiently complex without enough political champions and suffered from scope creep as the design specifications of the project were a moving target. Despite, or perhaps because of, its visionary nature, it failed before deployment. Over the course of time, a number of other attempts at deploying these types of systems have been made. PRT applies imagination to envision a new mode, comprising new networks and new vehicles, and for that reason it is to be praised. But maybe it reaches too far. A truly new combination of networks and vehicles has seldom been deployed in the history of transportation. One might suppose the railroad to be the best example of such a deployment. As we saw, even it drew on antecedents in mining operations where animal-drawn carts on tracks were used to move coal. Prior to that, there were, of course, already animal-drawn carts on roads. Elevators are another similar technology where automation replaced labor, and in general, elevators were not feasible when relying on animal or human labor, and so were rare prior to automation. Other technologies either use natural networks, shipping, aviation, or existing roads, automobiles. While the modes using natural networks still require new nodes, a point-based facility, a port or airport, is much easier to deploy than a line. Eventually, as autos began to be widespread, old roads were upgraded and new roads constructed to accommodate them. But it can be seen as a process of co-evolution. Vehicles use existing networks. The network is upgraded to accommodate new vehicles, 
the vehicles are upgraded to best fit the new network. Among the PRT promoters are mechanical engineering professor Edward Anderson of the University of Minnesota, who holds patents on a number of related technologies and formed the company Taxi 2000, which used to sound far more futuristic than it does today. Taxi 2000 pushed its SkyWeb Express system in its constructed test facility. Proponents such as Anderson claim that government policies are preventing their technology. While government may not be helping much, we think the problem is more fundamental. PRT, like automated highway systems, requires developing vehicles that can only use the PRT network. Because of network effects, the value of building a PRT system increases with the size of the system, and when fully blown, may actually meet some of the promoter's goals. The problem is the lack of value in a small system, and any system will initially be small, yet it will require a high fixed cost just to get going. Technologies are first proven in small market niches and then expanded, not deployed widely on promise. Thus, there is no deployment path to PRT. To date, operational PRT systems have been deployed at London Heathrow Airport, connecting to some parking lots, in Mazda City, Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates, underneath this planned community. These are both subsidized systems and more experimental than practical. Other deployments are planned or in process, for, for example, Amritsar, India, to serve the Golden Temple. The market niche where a PRT is better than a people mover, the automobile, or conventional fixed route transit is limited. The most likely outcome is the convergence of autonomous vehicles and PRT systems, though these will differ from the original tracked, grade-separated PRT vision. Twenty three point nine reinventing fixed route transit. Twenty three point nine point one retrenchment. Mass transit systems in the United States are collectively losing money. Yet some individual routes, including bus routes, earn enough to pay their own operating and even capital costs. While we see new fixed route rail systems being constructed in some markets with federal support, agencies are also financially strapped in cutting services. In general, this is not being done strategically. We can divide individual systems into three sets of routes. First, those routes that break even or profit financially at a given fare, that is, there is a fare at which this is true. This is the core. Those lines which are necessary for the core routes to break even and collectively help those set of routes, these are the feeders. Those lines which lose money and whose absence would not reduce profits on other routes by more than their costs. These equity services are there as a social support system rather than economic efficiency, serving social and especially spatial political equity objectives. Since public takeover of transit systems, their role has changed. Originally, the private services were meant to make money for their owners, and they did this by providing services that were sufficiently valuable to consumers that they generated more revenue than they cost to operate. The role of transit as a transportation agency or as a welfare agency continues to be debated, though usually not out loud. It is pretended the agency can serve two masters, but the alternative goals, providing spatial coverage to serve everyone equally, or providing high frequency to serve some markets well, are in conflict. The goal of covering costs is at odds with providing subsidized service. We think to be successful transit agencies should clarify their objective. If they are to be considered primarily transportation services, they should be considered and reorganized as public utilities rather than departments of government. Utilities by definition provide a useful service for a price to their users. If they are instead to be welfare services, that should be made explicit. As transportationists, we have a clear opinion on the matter. The agency should identify and propose to retrench the financially sustainable system and present local politicians with a choice. If local politicians want additional equity services, for example, covering low ridership suburban routes, they should be given a list with a cost of subsidy per line and then can conf collectively choose which lines to finance out of general revenue, as this is primarily a welfare rather than a transportation function. In other words, public transit organizations would present the public with a bill for these services, the subsidy required in order to at least break even on operating them, that is, the difference between their revenue and their cost, and not be expected to pay for them out of operating revenue. If the cost of those lines is deemed too expensive, that is, the politicians are unwilling to pay for them with general revenue tax dollars, they should be canceled. Transit agencies would no longer be losing money. They would now be break-even or slightly profitable. They might even pay a dividend to their owners, the general public. This is roughly how transit is organized in many other countries, for example, England, discussed below. General revenue, the Treasury, would of course now be losing money. We didn't pull money from thin air. But since this is a social welfare redistribution function, that is perfectly appropriate. This would entirely change public and political perception of transit services. It might also result in fewer bad routes being funded, since it would be crystal clear where the subsidies lay. The which routes to fund decision should be revisited regularly. 
23.9.2, subsidizing the traveler, not the system. Transit fares presently cover only a small fraction of the operating costs, even in the best U.S. transit markets. To provide an efficient set of choices, all modes should cover all of their costs, including both direct and negative externalities, unless a coherent reason is provided for subsidy, such as evidence of large economic spillovers. Transit is probably furthest from covering its full costs of all the land modes covered in the book. Capital costs are already sunk, and in a market with decreasing average costs, that is, economies of scale, recovering capital costs might not be warranted. On the other hand, operating costs are roughly proportional to the amount of service provided. While the marginal traveler imposes no additional cost, assuming an available seat, the marginal 50 travelers almost certainly require an extra bus. To break even on the system, transit fares would need to cover average costs of operating services. If these resulting fares are too high, politicians should give the users they are concerned with money directly. It makes more sense to do that than to subsidize people who are perfectly capable of paying so that some group doesn't face a full cost that they cannot pay. If they don't want to give poor people money, for example because they don't trust poor people with cash or fear they would use the money for something other than transit, say food or housing or heat, they should top up their transit smart card, for example by adding funds weekly. These funds would come from a separate government agency, let's call it the Transportation Opportunities Office, which is completely separate from the transit organization. The recipients of government subsidy would use the same smart card as everyone else, so no public stigma is attached to using the card. Moving towards smart card systems is efficient all around, saving boarding times and reducing transit run times. Currently, transit is sometimes subsidized by employers and university campuses, particularly with the use of seasonal passes. Income-based vouchers are also used for people who might be running paratransit services in rural areas. The same kind of subsidies can be extended to other groups. 23.9.3, contracting out. U.S. public transit services are currently provided by the agencies directly. They hold a monopoly on providing services, were staffed by public sector union, and had little incentive to innovate. Before the 1980s, the United Kingdom was facing the same set of issues. In response, a new model was instituted, in which transit services would be bid out, private firms could compete on how much they would pay to provide service on given routes, or what subsidy they required in order to provide the service. In exchange, they would keep the fares they collected, motivating them to increase demand by providing high-quality services. This model has been widely credited with improving the quality and reliability of bus services in London, as reflected by the long-run increasing demand and reduction in costs though has not been without detractors. The figure shows trends in ridership throughout the United Kingdom. Clearly, London is doing something different and successful, having doubled ridership since its early 1980s nadir, while ridership elsewhere has tended to drop. This model could be adopted elsewhere. 23.9.4, the product. If you're not paying for it, you're the product. Transit has several sources of revenue. One, of course, is the fare bucks, but in most markets, this fails to cover even operating costs. Another is advertising. While this is relatively small, less than 5% of agency revenue, it could grow. A Transportation Research Board study makes a number of recommendations to increase the share of revenue. Just as much content on the internet, in newspapers, and in magazines is subsidized by advertising, some transportation services is subsidized by advertising as well, and more could be. This phenomenon of advertising-supported services is encapsulated in the famous recent quote at the top of the section. Transit advertising comprises several major components, interior and exterior. Interior ads inside the vehicle or station are aimed at customers. The exterior ads on the vehicle or outside at bus stops, bus benches, and so on are aimed mostly at non-customers. Historically, interior advertising has been static. With Spark payment cards, we now know who is on the vehicle or in the station, and with RFID tags, we could even know where they are sitting. Department store magnate John Wanamaker is reputed to have said, Half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half. But now, just as with the internet, advertising can now be customized. Electronic screens instead of cardboard can provide dynamic advertising customized to both the transit user and the location of the vehicle. It should be more effective. It might be more profitable if the ability to sell advertising outweighs the extra costs. Both captive and choice writers are the classic captive audience. They can turn their heads, but can't really escape. Users should appreciate this because it can be more useful that as advertising is not inherently bad, it might inform you of a product you actually would want but were unaware of, or of a discount on the product, and, too, the extra revenue from the advertising can keep fares down. We should expect to see more and more customized advertising in the next generation of transit vehicles. There are other less innovative but po still possibly lucrative sources of funds for transit agencies. Some agencies have sold naming rights to stations. 
While this is generally a bad idea from a wayfinding perspective, it does provide revenue for agencies seeking funds. Another strategy, station sponsorships, such as Apple in Chicago, may help, but likely won't generate as much money. 23.10 Discussion Simplifying the broad sweep of history, we imagine for passenger transportation, a walking and draft animal society, a transit and electric interurban and intercity passenger train society, and the auto society. Walking gave way to transit, and transit gave way to the auto. In each case, the transition was not graceful. It stranded older fixed investments and was costly to those for whom lifestyle changes were neither easy nor desirable. Gave way was destructive of desirable aspects of life, such as the activities best served by walking and transit. With this preamble, we may state the transit and walking problems as a failure of automobilization. The automobile system innovation failed to the extent that it could not fully replace transit or walking. One response to the transit and walking problem presents itself. Tweak the automobile highway system so that it can more effectively substitute for transit and walking. Niche fitting is another response. Suppose we focus investments in the niches they best work. Highways in low-density environments, fixed route transit in high-density areas. Interfaces and boundaries will always remain an issue. How does one travel from a low density to a high density environment, or vice versa? What happens when environments, land uses, relative prices, technologies, policies change over time? What constitutes low and high density? Cars need not fail for transit to succeed. Each mode has its use. The problem comes in deploying it where it doesn't fit. For example, urban freeways, cars on campus, low volume suburban fixed route transit. If we don't acknowledge the misfit, we will waste scarce resources, time, and money that could be better spent elsewhere. There is not necessarily one answer that fits the entire country. A policy option is the devolution of federal activity in the transit or even surface transportation area. This is an idea periodically discussed in Washington, D.C., seriously in 1982, most recently in 2012. In Senator Lamar Alexander's proposal, the states would pick up transportation and education costs in exchange for the federal government funding Medicaid. While the linkage seems strange, and we are accustomed to dealing with transportation policy within the transportation field, there are broader society issues at work. The reasoning behind one objection to devolution runs this way. Healthy cities are in the national interest. Therefore, a federal role for transit is in the federal interest. That claims too much, and it ignores the question of whether the federal government has or could create an effective role. Another objection is on equity grounds. Some cities aren't as wealthy as others, and it is only fair to send money from here to there. However, in conflicts between the central city and its suburbs, state governments can and do deal with such issues, to no one's satisfaction. Consider, for instance, the long plan many times started and now under construction 2nd Avenue sub Subway in New York City. This is an important piece of infrastructure for New York with its crowded transit system. It is expected to cost $17 billion, more than a quarter of the first phase and presumably subsequent phases will be federally funded. All of its users will be in New York. Almost all will be New York residents. Why is it an important national priority? We must remember most transportation is local, and most transportation funding is local, and most federal dollars are returned to the states that generate them. Is the Washington middleman necessary? Yes, the same argument applies to roads as to transit. Overall, we see transit in the United States as a niche market business, serving the few remaining dense areas of U.S. cities, mostly those built before 1920, and otherwise one that should be more focused on serving those without choices, the transportation disadvantaged such as the poor, elderly, disabled, and children, rather than providing additional and largely worse choices to those who already have options, the car. Policy ought to treat it that way. It should recognize that in spite of enormous expenditures, the transit market is not expanding. Transit trips are up, of course, which is not surprising given the massive investments and growing population, but trips per capita are essentially flat for almost four decades. Niche markets offer appropriate environments for innovation and system improvements where lessons from other modes and other technologies may apply. Transit can certainly do better than it has, but even if it were to double or quadruple the share of U.S. travel it serves, it would remain a niche.